What's up internet, it's your soul and I'm going to be covering here a topic which really in my opinion should be talked about daily, it should be taught in schools, everybody should understand what I'm about to explain. We should just know it, um, but really there are no shoulds. This is a free world planet and everyone goes their own way and they figure stuff out on their own. Um, we have a situation where many people have enforced their own shoulds onto people and they do it through media and the school systems and so on. So. Most people have a shared perspective on certain things, such as politics and governance and so on, uh, which doesn't really include the ideas I'm going to put across here. So um, I'm doing their shoulds. I'm just going to give you an alternative perspective, let's say. Now, I've titled this video um, Creating World Peace, and also politics is futile without this. Now, what I mean by that is, um, I'm going to be sharing ideas here which identify how politics itself, the whole concept of politics, is literally a complete waste of time unless you understand certain facts, what I would call facts, logically provable facts. And these things come from a grounded understanding in logic and in knowing who I am and how I connect to the planet and so on. Um, these, if, if we're making decisions about life and about plan, uh, the planet's systems and ecology and so on, and we don't really ground our thinking in fact and in um, non-debatable logic, let's say, i.e. basing our logic on understandings which are irrefutable, then we are opening the door to error and suffering. Basically, we're going to be causing errors and um, you know, imbalance ultimately, and that's what we've had, politically speaking, and as a, a human group for a very, very long time. We've had lots of errors, lots of dysfunction, trial and error, um, guesswork, deliberate manipulation, suffering, genocide, mass murder, so on, you name it. What I'm suggesting here is we take a completely different view and we, we start at the start and we can start in the heart and uh, we make our way to absolute truth. Now, there's a simple way to do this. I've talked about this before. Um, I've not had anybody else mention this. Um, as far as I know, this is something that I um, intuited and, you know, it's fairly simple, but you can feel the truth ultimately. And, and many people I've spoken to actually have lost that ability. They don't, for whatever reason, their brain or some aspect of them hasn't um, become aligned so that they're so easy to do that. It's so easy for them to do this, but I'm pretty sure everybody can do it with a little bit of practice perhaps some healing and emotional processing. So what am I talking about? Well, if you say out loud, I exist, and maybe do that now, I'll give you a couple of seconds. Now, how does that feel? To me, I feel a certainty. I feel there's no resistance in me to that statement. I know I exist. It's just a statement of fact. And it's irrefutable. I can't really debate it. I couldn't be having these thoughts unless I existed. It's obvious. So there's no error in that. There's no doubt there's an absolute certainty it's absolute fact and truth that i exist if i now say the opposite and say i definitely don't exist maybe you do that too how does that feel how does the feeling of saying that you don't exist compare to the feeling of saying that you do exist to me i feel he hesitance resistance tension uh, discord and it's just a knowing that that's not true, basically. So why am I saying it? Now, maybe you don't notice the difference between those two things because you're not so interested in aligning your actions to the truth, let's say, perhaps. Um, or you're just not so emotionally conscious at this point. But those feelings can be tuned into. They're an inherent quality of, of us as beings. So once you start to tune into that, then you can start to have a sense of a uh, kind of compass to know, at least from your perspective, what's true or not. And sometimes we're saying things we don't really know what our position is on them, but we say them anyway because we've got beliefs. So I try to get rid of all beliefs, basically. I don't, don't really value beliefs. I, I just try to have knowledge and thinking and emotions. So there's a lack of certainty. If there's a lack of certainty about what I think, then I just say, I, I think this. It doesn't mean to say that it's definitely true or that I'm going to even base any actions on it. So with all that in mind, um, my suggestion is that we approach our perception of how to, let's say, organise life using that kind of understanding and reassess things. And that's what I've been doing for a long time. So I'm going to take you to a, 
screen here of the definition of the word politics. So um, I don't always really like this dictionary site, but you know it's it's good enough for this. So definition of politics: the art or science of government. Okay. Well, we can get into what government is, but fine. I mean, most people have some understanding of what government is. The art or science concerned with guiding or influencing governmental policy. The art or science concerned with winning and holding control over a government. So basically, in that version of the word, it's obviously all about government. And government ultimately is a group of people setting policy for everyone else, telling them how they can and can't live and so on. Um, so it's the politics is obviously, as most people, most people would understand, it's actions taken to gain influence and control over that process. Uh, political actions, practices and policies, and political affairs or business, especially competition between competing interest groups or individuals for power and leadership. Political life, especially as a principal activity or profession. Political activities characterised by artful or often dishonest practices. So even in the dictionary, it literally defines politics as including <laughs> dishonesty. Um, yeah, well, you know, thumbs up for that at least. But um, so why would it be that even the dictionary here recognises that politics is inherently dishonest? It's not saying it could be dishonest. Um, well, it kind of is saying that, but it's, it's going more than that. It's saying often. So it's not just every now and again. It's actually often. Uh, and then the last definition here, political opinions of sympathies of a person, political opinions or sympathies of a person, the total complex of relations between people living in society. Relations or conduct in a particular area of experience, especially as seen or dealt with from a political point of view. So all of these things relate to basically the way that humans interact and how they live their life ultimately. So it's the ability to affect that. Now, Do you want someone else affecting how you live your life? Well, in some cases, maybe you do. Maybe you think you're not confident enough, you don't really know enough about life, and maybe you want a coach or something like that voluntarily to come and give you some advice. Okay, but do you want somebody forcing themselves into that position? Probably not. Um, do you want somebody forcing themselves into that position down the barrel of a gun using a police force or military? Probably not. Um, and yet, how? what percentage of people think voting is a good idea and think that democracy is a good idea. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's probably pretty high. I mean, I don't tend to meet that many people who think it's a bad idea on my daily journeys in offline world. Um, and yet, every time you vote, you are literally voting that you and everyone else has to deal with the fact that someone is going to potentially threaten you with a gun or violence or putting put in a cage or whatever if you don't go along with what they say. And the main reason why this has been perpetuating without any, without so many people challenging it, in my opinion, is that if the policies set by the government are in alignment with what the average person thinks they want or need, then people don't complain about it because they, they basically say, well, the government's enforcing what I, how I want things to be, more or less, and I'm okay with living within those limits, so no problem. And, you know, that means that if that keeps me safe, then so be it. That's... From my understanding, that's the general kind of thought process that goes through people's minds when they when they advocate for voting and, and democracy and government and so on. They don't often go beyond that and realise what I'm trying to point to here, which is that you've lost something in that. You've lost freedom, you've lost free will. You've basically agreed that everyone has to lose a certain amount of free will so you can be safe. And the people who manage that process will be the people who win an election. You don't really know whether they really won an election or not because you don't know whether it was rigged or not, but you're just trusting blindly, basically, that that's the case. And even if the elections weren't rigged, you're still basically saying that a subgroup of the population, typically with lots of money because they need that to win an election nowadays, um, using the rules of the system devised by the people who run the government, funnily enough. So people have basically created a system for themselves um, to determine whether or not they can keep running the countries. Uh, and funnily enough, it seems to have worked out so that only people such as them can really do that. Uh, so by going along with all of this, you're basically saying that those people get to control what everyone else is uh, able to do. And people tend to think that they have some say in that because they can go and talk to their representatives and so on. And, you know, to some extent, they do have some say in that because ultimately those representatives don't want to be guillotined. Um, and they do want to be able to live their life um, without being too hassled too much. But... Ultimately, they do definitely try to get away with as much as possible. So these politicians basically generally find themselves in a position where they are attempting to 
be seen to be serving the public on in as much as possible but in reality trying to get away with doing what they really want to do um, behind the scenes and that's literally i mean that sums up pretty much what especially american politics and many other countries politics has been about for a very long time this sort of public image managed image uh, of politicians uh, versus the actual reality of what is going on and you know the the, the recent story with jeffrey epstein and the high profile pedophiles and probably lots more going on behind the scenes with that blackmail and you know those tentacles go into very nasty places um which the average person doesn't really know anything about or won't accept as being real but um you know I, from my research into this having done this for a long time i'm fairly sure that what's really going on behind the scenes of politics it, it would it makes horror movies look ch childish in many cases um so from my perspective this is why i'm so motivated to look for solutions to fix this because to me it's a problem if uh, if anybody is telling other people what to do so you know why why have we got this situation why is it even possible for people to tell other people what to do so so ultimately this this thing of having control over over other people is important to realize that it's a form of imbalance and balance is important you know if your body's out of balance you get sick if your car's out of balance you crash uh, if a goat's out of balance it falls off the mountainside you know um, if your diet's out of balance you get fat or whatever um ill so you know we know inherently the balance is very important a whole body is um, set up to constantly keep itself in balance and yet we don't seem to really focus on balance to the extent that we probably should do at some point there's been a disconnection between the balance that keeps us alive and what our minds are thinking our minds generally aren't trained to focus on balance they've been trained to focus on facts and memories and imagination and images and you know the things that society teaches you to focus into uh, it wasn't for me personally until i got into meditation yoga zen uh, martial arts and these things each of those taught me a different important aspect about balance and when i then trained to become a systems engineer uh, i then realized also that balance is essential um, in programming and, and um, creating systems because just like with a car or any, any kind of machine if it's not in balance if it's something's out of balance something's over, overpowering something else it just doesn't work properly um, so it's not until you actually become an engineer ultimately or a creative person and you, or, you know an artist uh, that you, and you actually start to create things that you're really forced to, to be confronted with this issue of balance and you realize that if you don't understand it deeply you just can't succeed in what you're doing uh, so balance is defined accurately as being uh, no part or aspect or person overpowering any other which means that every voice has a has its presence every um, piece of information and insight every subcomponent of a unit of a, of a system or however you want to think of it of a society every person is able to fulfill themselves and achieve what they want to do and that requires that they don't overpower anyone else so that to me is perfect that's like a perfect scenario for society and that's where i know we need to go and that's where i'm aiming to go uh, and i know that politics basically is the opposite of that and i've said before you know if politics was meant to solve our problems the problems would already be solved um it's self-explanatory really they've had so much power and so much time to do these things and generally speaking we're still dealing with lots of the problems created by politics as opposed to the natural problems we would have as humans living on a daily basis which these political people claim to be solving so i've got some notes here and i'm just reading from from the from the background so Basically, I've said here, um, the system of politics and government is inherently imbalanced. And it's always the case that governments use monopoly on violence. A monopoly on violence. So that's an important phrase that you may have not heard before. Monopoly means basically total control. You, you are the only entity, or whoever we're talking about, is the only entity that has access to this thing, whatever it is they have a monopoly on. So a monopoly on violence basically says you are the only group who can use violence in a valid way. And that's what governments try to have if somebody acts violently that isn't part of their group then they claim authority to step in and attack that person ultimately or group so they have a monopoly on violence and they can then therefore overpower whoever they want so any corrupt person anyone who doesn't want to live in balance anybody who wants to build an empire or overpower anyone else is obviously going to target government first and foremost as their first port of call to try to achieve their goals because government has this sanctioned role as being a power um dealer and a violence dealer so therefore if you're somebody who wants to use power and violence to overpower other people the, what better way to use 
the vehicle of the people that they use to defend themselves against them. I mean, that's standard in martial arts to use someone's energy against them uh, and psychological warfare and so on. So if people create these machines, these systems to defend themselves, then if you can control those machines and systems, then they can't defend themselves. It's a bit like if you imagine a wolf trying to attack a hen house, if the wolf makes great friends with the farmer somehow or figures out how to open the door to the hen house, uh, you know, and turn off the alarm system, then the wolf can do whatever he wants or she wants. Uh, so, you know, we should always, when we listen to politicians, always have this in mind that what we're listening to are the people who are most likely to either be or be targeted by the enemies of the people, first of all. Um, so we should never take their words at face value. And so the degree to which ultimately anybody can overpower someone else um, using these systems is the degree to which the police, military and government are corrupted the court system uh, away from what the average person or what people really need. And also key, it also depends on the degree to which people allow it to happen. You agree to the choices that the, these corrupt systems are advocating. Um, whether they're consciously doing it or not. So this opens up very many important points. So uh, so I've written here, pe people support politics because they've been taught to believe that it's in their best interest to do so. Sometimes because they will get beaten if they don't support politics or for more positive reasons, such as that they think they can gain something through it. However, in almost all cases, nearly everyone loses valuable things as a result of politics. And the things they think they gain could have been gained in other ways without losing out what they really need to be keeping. So, in other words, politics to me is a con game. It's it's a it's a system that's. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but but it very quickly, probably since the very beginning, became that. And it's really just been a game of cat and mouse, where or chess, however you want to think of it, where people in government try to figure out how to get one over on the people constantly as much as possible. And I think. I think what we're seeing with with Jeffrey Epstein and all these child abusing necromancers and crazy people who uh, are in government or connected so closely to government, bearing in mind that Jeffrey Epstein was on the Council of Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, these are groups very, very, very involved with government and military actions and so on, um, and friends with various different people at high levels and presidents and so on. Um, bearing in mind that, yeah, these people are all interconnected and they are basically in this constant power struggle with each other, their, their mind is all totally competition-based, basically. You know, the whole idea of capitalism basically is competition. Um, and I think part of why Jeffrey Epstein was so, I mean, apparently he was having two or three girls coming, to, uh, underage girls coming to him every day. I mean, you know, for an average person, let's say even somebody who's got a high sex drive, having two or three different people coming to have sex with them every single day, it's not, you don't need that, do you? I mean, it's like there's no practical reason for you to need that. Obviously, you've got some sort of deep ingrained psychological issue around that. And I would suggest that part of it is competition and lack of self-acceptance that's become pathological. It's become heavily unconscious and just like this massive program running that's just, you know, taken over his life, apparently. I mean, there may be more to it, maybe ritual things and other unusual things going on, but... It's a bit like, you know, men who have trophy wives and so on. They're, they're, you know, they don't have love for these people. They're basically there um, with them to just be seen to be this powerful, important person. Because that's what they want. That, you know, to them, that's what gets their dopamine running. It's what gives them a kick um, and so on. So bear in mind that these people are basically in a power struggle with each other. They, can't, they can only take so much power from people before people get annoyed with them. So, but because they're in competition to get more power all the time, they're likely to be, you know, quite open to manipulating things more and more and more and more um, and lying more and more and more to get more and more power. And, you know, that's what authoritarian dictators have done. It's what monarchs have done in the past and still do. Uh, it's what people like Jeffrey Epstein and probably most, if not all, world leaders do to some extent or massively. So we're, from that perspective, from a systems perspective, from just a common sense perspective, that's like almost the worst we could have. What we have in terms of governance and societal structure is pretty much the worst we could have. We could have worse. We could have, um, I don't know, like Hannibal Lecter literally running the military and openly walking down the street eating people. You know, that might be a bit worse, but it's not that much different. Let's be honest. So um, 
So, you know, it's important to understand how all of this works so we can dismantle it and replace it with something that's saner and that actually feels good and that helps humanity be the best versions of themselves. Even the most corrupt and twisted people have a lot to learn and can heal and can ultimately at some point form a useful part of society um, and you know, be happier as a result too. So, what are the points required for political entities to build their power base and manipulate people? Well, they need to use deception, they need to use denial, which is kind of tied in together. Uh, they need to use manipulation, i.e. manipulating scenarios, people, events, information, the truth, uh, so that it's not quite as it really is, uh, which is all part of the deception and denial as well. Uh, social engineering, which is a specific kind of application of science on to, onto the population in various ways to achieve their goals. half truth manipulation, again, all of these things relate to each other. Uh, then they also require hierarchy, and this is very important. They require the ability for people to do as they're told, not ask questions, and act on their orders. Because obviously one person can't control 20 million people um, themselves. But if they've got a tree of people um, gradually enacting uh, more and more and more violence over as you go through the, the hierarchy, or at least having a layer that enacts violence to control it all, um, then they can achieve much more than they can do as one person. Hitler would never have been able to achieve what he did without, obviously, the Nazi army and um, SS and so on controlling everyone and, you know, using whatever tactics they did. Probably hypnosis was a big part of that and, and various things like that. But without hierarchy, basically no political evil is possible. No genocide really is possible. None of the massive crimes that we've seen against humanity really are possible without some form of hierarchy. Um, it also requires heartlessness. Because if you've got a real heart that's compassionate and courageous and intends peace, balance and well-being, um, then you would never do any of these things either. So deception, denial, manipulation, social engineering, hierarchy and heartlessness. It's pretty much a portrait of politics, I would say. Um, even though people would like to think it isn't, I think most people would recognise all of those things within politics. And they might like to say, oh, well, my favourite politician doesn't do those things. Well, they do do hierarchy because they couldn't be a politician without those things, without that. Um, they do do social engineering because that's what governments do. That's you know very much what governments do. Uh, they do do manipulation because, you know, again, they can't really operate within the halls of politics without some degree of manipulation. It's just that's just they're so it's so ingrained in there that um, if they come forward with absolute truth, basically, which doesn't require any manipulation, which some do from time to time. Eventually, it will lead people to realise the absolute truth of the corruption of politics, and that will put them out of a job. So they can never do that too much. So there has to be manipulation. Uh, so therefore, there has to be denial, and therefore there has to be deception. So just simple logic means that all of those things have to be present to some extent. And all of that is heartless, ultimately. To be involved in all of that is heartless to some extent. So really, you know, from my perspective, even if there are people against politics with good intentions and they start out without being involved in any of these things at all, as soon as they get into it, they're part of it because that's what politics is. So, you know, I would say we can do better than that. So either the politicians are using these to manipulate other people or the people are doing this to themselves and each other, uh, meaning voters, basically. So either, you know, this is being done to you as a voter or probably you're doing it to yourself in order to go along with all of this. You may know that you're doing it or you may not. So in other words, the average person is also involved in deception, denials, manipulation, social engineering, hierarchy or heartlessness or and heartlessness. Unless they've seen through all of this stuff and they want to change it. Um, so the only way to have real balance um, is to end those six dysfunctions. That's a requirement. So how do we end deception, denials, manipulation, social engineering, hierarchy and heartlessness? Well, I have the answer to that. Uh, I've talked about it quite a lot and I'll talk about it a bit more here. So. Uh, the result of all of that, the result of ending these dysfunctions, will be actual free will. So people can actually live as they want to live. And that requires that we don't overpower each other. That we respect free will of ourselves and other people and animals and so on. And we let everyone just live their life without interfering with them. And when we cross paths or where we need to negotiate something with each other, um, we always remember that, that we're here to support free will. Um, and... As long as you remember that and you come in good faith, let's say, 
um, to resolve a problem, then you can. It will always work because at the root level, what you need to be alive is fairly simple on this planet. You need, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what you personally need, but I need warmth, um, clean air, water, food, room to move, sunshine, uh, and various other things. But those basics don't cost a whole lot. I don't need to have 10,000 acres of land to myself to achieve that. So although we are probably a bit overpopulated in terms of humans at the moment, there's still enough resources to go around if we were actually living in a balanced way. So I don't need to be going around fighting people to try and take an extra bit of land here and there. There's just no purpose to it. Unless someone else has already done that and is trying to force themselves on me. But then I didn't cause that problem, did I? They did. Um, by not living in a balanced way, not respecting people's needs. So it doesn't take a whole lot to live from the heart and just move beyond this constant competitive capitalist paradigm. And often people assume, because they're heavily programmed and conditioned, to think that anybody who talks about going beyond democracy and capitalism must be talking about communism. And communism's bad and kills lots of people. But no, I'm not talking about communism. I'm not a communist. Uh, I haven't even properly... I mean, I did study communism at school um, during my uh, GCSEs and A-levels in, in Britain. Um, but not sufficiently to even be able to tell you how it could ever work. And I don't think it could ever work because I think it was based on fraudulent logic um, but it's a very complicated subject many people have written about communism who have completely opposing views on what communism even is so they would argue all day long about what communism was so to try and say that communism is good or bad or i'm a communist or i'm not a communist or you are or you aren't you have to really get into the details of what this word means and i'm certainly not going to do that in this video but is it relevant to me anyway because i'm not advocating for communism what i'm talking about is basically free will which is not communism um, free will means everybody gets to do what they feel they need to do without overpowering anyone else. Simple. Um, but it means that everybody has to have self-empowered uh, understanding of themselves and of free will. So it basically is an evolved state. We need to evolve to come into balance. We need to learn and really focus as a high priority individually into what this is so that we can all manifest it. And that is free will. It's not something that someone comes along and gives you and tells you, right, this is how it's going to be. That's not what free will is. Free will is you decide for you what things are going to be. But you must understand free will in order to do that effectively and in a sustainable way. Um, so if we were asking, if I, if I was answering the question of the title of this video, Puti politics is futile without this, what is that thing? Well, the thing it's futile without is an understanding of free will. And basically everything is futile without an understanding of free will, at least on this planet. Uh, if we don't create real peace, um, then we are stuck in a power struggle forever with constant casualties and no real progress. Do you really think any real progress has been made in human history? Really? <laughs> uh, we have more advanced technology than we did in the last few thousand years, but setting aside the high probability that lost civilizations advanced their technology even further and were then destroyed, so Atlantis and these kinds of uh, stories, like setting that aside, even though I think it's quite likely, is technology itself really a sign of progression? Um, you know, speaking as somebody who's trained as a technology engineer and has spent more time than most focused into it, I would say, no, it's not. It's actually something which is a crutch, which we would be better off not using and developing our own personal power instead. Um, so, but aside from, from my personal views of whether technology is help, healthy or not, um, when the technology is fundamentally being used to kill, maim, and manipulate, such as uh, micro, uh, microwave warfare, smartphone spying, drone warfare, nuclear weapons, covert black projects, taking massive amounts of funds from the population without them even knowing, um, and on and on and on and on, uh, you know, manipulation of the food supply for profit and to the detriment of people's health, manipulation of pretty much everything by corporate and government military in interests. That's where most of the money's going into all of that stuff and, and all of the technology that's, that comes out of that. And pretty much all the technology that we use on a daily basis was invented to support those aims. It's just that we have been given bits and pieces of it that are useful to us, but which are useful to them. Like, you know, the fact that everyone has smartphones, or most people do, you know, you think, oh, it's great, we can talk to each other and do all this stuff. Yeah, that is kind of useful, but it also allows us to be totally monitored and spied on all the time, which is exactly what these corporations and groups want. Um, control. So 
you know, basically when the technology, I think, think about, you know, people think, oh, well, medical science has advanced so much. Uh, we can solve all these problems. Well, no, we can't actually solve a lot of problems using medical science, using mainstream medical science. And we can do certain things, but, you know, many cures exist for many illnesses, which medical science says there's no cure for. And the reason they say that is because they can't make money out of it because the cures are either free or well, they're basically they're free or nearly free. And they're in the interest, their business is making money and controlling people. And they're not generally speaking, these big corporations involved in the medical industry, not generally there to actually help people. Um, you know, there's a famous, famous quote or meme that basically says uh, the money in healthcare is not in healthy people. It's not in dead people. It's somewhere in between. In other words, if everyone's healthy or dead, then there's no money for those corporations. But if everyone's a bit sick, then they make money, right? It's not hard to figure this out. Um, so given that technology is generally being used for all these nefarious purposes, and it definitely is, provably, um, have we really made any, any progress as a humanity as a result of all this technology? Are we not really just seeing a different form of some sort of arms race when cavemen were looking to figure out how to carry bigger and bigger rocks to throw at each other. I mean, that's literally how I see a lot of this stuff. It's just fancy rock throwing, basically. Um, so the only real progress that humanity can make is one that's felt and that delivers real balance. And it's from the heart as well. And, and that's real progress. Then you will start to see and, and imagine and experience things which we never dreamed possible before. And solutions will come to things which people just never realized that were there all the time but they just were so focused on erroneous topics that they never figured this stuff out um, so this requires uh, many features of society that we've taken for granted um, and even think we can't live without basically to be replaced or ended so what replaces them will be much better provided we understand the full details and make the right decisions the most fundamental of these is as I said, to set a respect for free will as the highest priority for all of us. And that's there is no argument against that, basically. If you really think about it, it's one of the arguments or ideas that doesn't have a counter argument. What could be the problem with everybody respecting free will? Uh, well, everyone gets to do what they want to do. And, you know, usually people conditioning would say, well, if everyone gets to do what they want to do, then, uh, I don't know, maybe people would attack each other, they wouldn't go to work, uh, and so on. But, well, people can do that now, and they're not respecting free will fully. But if you get to do exactly what you want to do, then you also respect what everyone else wants to do. And as I said, you, you, you work to find that middle ground, that harmony and that balance. And as a result, you're freer and happier, and you don't have stress worrying about whether someone's going to come and rob you or something like that because you know they're respecting free will. But this can't be forced on anyone. So it literally is the perfect the perfect objective for humanity. Literally perfect. There's no error in it for us to respect free will. The issue is how do we do it? And, you know, that's fairly complicated, but simple at the same time. Um, complexity is a lot of simplicity stuck together, after all. Uh, so the biggest challenge, let's say, perhaps to this, um, aside from people's stuck thinking um, and limiting belief systems, is that there are many people who actually don't care about others' free will. So how do we deal with the fact that even if I and 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of the population decide they're going to set free will as a high priority, how do we deal with the fact that most, well, many other people um, don't do that? So there are specific ways to deal with that, and I would suggest that, first of all, respect for free will produces more powerful and empowered people who are more successful. Uh, so it should just be the case that people can come together in groups, live that way, develop and evolve in successful ways, and then eventually um, they can't really be uh, attacked because of their increased power as a result of that. Um, but in the short term, on a daily basis, uh, we need to understand how we're empowering the people who are attacking us, because they only have our own power to work with or the power that other people have given them. And that's why this whole thing with government and politics is such a problem. Because when we give our power away and decision-making processes away to certain people, uh, we then lack the, the power to solve problems in our daily life. And we, we basically give it away to other people to come and do it for us and trust them that somehow magically they're going to do it in the right way. But we see, I mean, America is like a, a movie playing out all of this stuff all the time. That's why I focus on it so much. If you, if you look in the news from America, 
corruption of power there is so overt and massive that you can see every day you know horrific things being done by cops to people in wheelchairs you know you name it literally just disgraceful things they're doing um and the system justifies it just like in nazi germany you know everything the nazis did was legal because they ran the, the legal system they made it legal so you know basically we need to first and foremost recognize that we've been duped by the political process uh, it doesn't serve us and ultimately um, we need to replace it with something more effective that actually is caring and nurturing and balanced and harmonious and that intends our best interests um, and that doesn't involve anyone being overpowered. So a big part of that actually is free speech and you know you might not agree with what I say, I might not agree with what you say, but if we don't hear each other saying it then we don't really know what the hell's going on on planet Earth do we? We don't know why we feel like we feel when we walk past certain people. We don't know why people are acting as they are around us. We've got no idea because we don't know what they think. So it's so important to know what people think and free speech is absolutely the core of that. Um, and that's why I support free speech online and other uncensored social networks such as Eureka and Steam and so on. Every defined right and tenet in principle that underlines the constitution of countries can be warped and manipulated by politicians. So my suggestion is we don't allow them to do that and we create alternatives that don't create power pyramids whereby certain people can get to the top and control it. We need systems that where well, that isn't even possible. There isn't a pyramid, there isn't a position to climb to. There's just horizontal um, structure where people are basically equal within that system. They don't have power over each other. They might have different resources, they might have different needs, they might have different things in their life. Um, which they achieve through different means that we agree is okay, but they don't have the power to control other people. And that's really the core of how we have balance. So I'm going to do another video on Jeffrey Epstein in a few days with specifically focusing on all of that. There's so much information surrounding all of that and it's all coming out still. I don't want to rush in and start um, publishing on that subject because I prefer to wait until I've got a bit more information. But um, I just want to leave you with the last, the most important part of this, really, which is just about free will again. How does all of this play out? How does the replacement for the corrupt systems play out? It's up to you. That's what free will says. You create your own destiny. It's up to me. It's up to you. It's up to all of us. We all play a part in that. So I can't tell you how it's going to be. And you can't tell me how it's going to be. It's going to be how we create it to be. And we might agree it to be a certain way. I'm talking about society and the future of our lives and our children's lives. It might be a certain way based on what we think is best. And then we might change and then we might do something else and we might do something else. But the further we go towards balance um, and respect for free will, the more successful it will be. And that is the one thing I can say for sure, is that a society that doesn't quickly start to learn about the necessity of respect for free will and balance won't last very long, especially as technology increases, power pyramids increase, and this gap between rich and poor gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and there's an IQ gap as well, and then artificial intelligence comes in. Basically, you know, we are on the verge of having some sort of science fiction, dystopian nightmare, technocratic mindfuck where the wealthiest people on the planet literally enslave pretty much everyone or kill them off. I mean, that obviously there's lots of people talking about that, lots of evidence that people want to do that. Go and look at the Georgia Guidestones. You know, numerous different cults and groups have that as part of their aim. I don't think anybody who's studied these things knows that that's basically the truth. Um, people who haven't studied these things, that might sound ridiculous, but, you know, well, many things sound ridiculous until you study them, don't they? So, um, yeah, all I can say is focus on free will. All I can say with absolute certainty, certainty regarding this, absolute truth, is that if you focus on free will and set that as a highest priority, you will be pointing yourself towards the greatest outcome for yourself and everyone else. So I hope that makes sense. I know it makes sense to me, and I know it does make sense. So what I'm saying is I hope that you um, have been able to take all of that in and process it. And if you haven't or you've got questions, then definitely ask me in the comments wherever you see this, and I'll happily answer. And uh, do come and check out eureka.org, U-R-E-K-A.org, which is the social network that I run based on the Steam blockchain, which pays you in cryptocurrency to post uh, and comment. So you can earn just for being yourself and talking to people and sharing information. And it's, uh, the Steam is pretty much uncensored and it's there to help us heal, balance and evolve and manifest the greatest reality we can. So please do come along for free. It's free. Come and check it out and I'll see you there. So until next time, peace.